Okay, we're ready. Okay. So, hi everyone, um, I'm Gaetan Algeres, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Ed Newton Rex's talk entitled From Lab to Market Building AI Composition Products. And I think this topic is particularly relevant to the CSMC and Medium community because, as AI researchers on music, we often like to showcase our algorithms via collaboration with artists or demos, plugins, and concerts. Uh, but we seldom go beyond this and by, for instance, commercializing an actual product. And so back in 2010, so more than 10 years ago, and while graduating from Cambridge in music, Ed Newton Rex saw that there was there a tremendous uh, opportunity. And he learned to code and created Duke Deck, which is now one of the the startup in AI and music. And so since then, this company developed like software that autonomously composes original music on demand so that uh, non-musicians are now able to easily create rights clear music in just a matter of seconds. And so as of today, like this successful technology was used to create more than a million pieces of music and which are mostly used as backing music in uh, like online videos or ads and TV and radio shows, uh, but also in games, I think. And so after 10 years of existence, Duke Deck was acquired last year by ByteDance, which is the mother company, which owns uh, amongst other TikTok. And I'm pretty sure that this acquisition will have a major impact on how we perceive music on the usages and research on AI music, but also probably contribute to make AI music ubiquitous in our daily lives. And so now I'm really glad to let Ed talk and share his views on this fascinating subject. And then uh, you can ask any questions on the Slack channel. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the very warm introduction, Gaetan. I really, really appreciate it. Um, okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so, yeah, thank you for the intro. My name is Ed Newton Rex. It's really great to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm actually currently on paternity leave. Uh, we just had our first child. So, writing this talk has provided some very nice relief from seemingly endless nappy changes. Um, my background uh, is as a composer. While my main career is in tech, I have a side gig as a classical composer, mostly writing choral and piano music. But the reason I'm here is that, as Gaetan mentioned, I founded a tech startup called Duke Deck. We built AI composition tech. And on top of this, we built a product that let non-musicians easily create royalty-free soundtracks for their user-generated videos. Um, last year, we were acquired by TikTok, and I now head up product there in Europe. Um, the other week was actually the 10-year anniversary of my starting work on the project. Um, and we were, I think, the first of the modern wave of AI composition startups to, to get going 10 years ago. So I've had 10 years of thinking about how you build products on top of AI composition technology. Um, and that's the subject of this talk, from lab to market, building AI composition products. I'm sure everyone here thinks a lot about how to build AI composition technology. 
but technology that isn't used arguably might as well not exist. So when we're building technology, we have to think about how we're going to productize that technology. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so first off, I want to start by defining product management. Um, that's my job at TikTok. And those of you who work at tech companies will likely work with product managers or even be product managers yourself. Um, so product management is essentially about defining what a product should be uh, and then ensuring that product gets delivered. To be a good product manager, you have to have a basic understanding of a bunch of different fields, engineering, research, user interface, design, user research. When we're thinking about product management, we think about this. Um, a good product should be desirable, feasible, and viable. What does that mean? A desirable product means one that actually meets the user need. A feasible product means one that's technically possible to build. Uh, and a viable product means one that will make strategic sense for the business. Usually, that means that it has to make money. So products that hit all these three are a success, and those that don't generally aren't. So consider a couple of examples. YouTube, for instance. YouTube is desirable. People want to watch videos online. It's feasible. It was made feasible by increasing network speeds and by the spread of video recording technology. And it's viable. They make money from ads. And what about a product that doesn't meet all of these three? Um, you may have heard of uh, Theranos in the news uh, a couple of years ago, um, which touted rap rapid blood testing. It was desirable. A lot of people wanted much cheaper, quicker blood tests that required less blood. It was viable. Yes, people would have paid for it, but it wasn't feasible. They couldn't make it work and they ended up committing massive fraud in order to cover that up. So you need all three. I'm gonna talk about each of these three things in relation to AI composition products. I should say, I'm gonna talk the least about feasibility because really that's more your domain as researchers. Um, the feasibility of AI composition products depends heavily on great research continuing to be done, but I'll talk about all three. So desirability, forget AI composition for a moment. What makes a desirable product? What makes a product people wanna use? Well, in product management, we have another go-to tool that helps us think about this, what we call a user story. A user story is basically a sentence in this format. As a type of user, I want some goal so that some reason. So like, what's an example of this? Here are a couple of examples. Airbnb, what's Airbnb's core user story? As a holiday maker, I want to rent people's apartments so that I can feel like a local, right? Makes sense. Uber, what's, I mean, Uber has many user stories. What's one of the key ones? Here's one I've used before. As a party goer, I want to summon a taxi through my phone so that I'm not left stranded late at night. These may seem trite, but they're, they're tried and tested user stories. And what's good about them is that they force you to think about who the user is and why they want the thing that you're building. The idea is if you have good user stories, you can ensure you don't build something that people aren't gonna to want to use. So with this in mind, let's dive into the world of AI composition products. So I think there are three overarching types of AI composition products. The first is listening products, products in which the main purpose is actually listening to music. I'm gonna go through a few examples of these and look at their user stories. So one of the first serious attempts at AI composition was made, as you'll know, by two academics in the US, Hiller and Isaacson. In 1956, just four years after the university built its first computer and in the same year that the term artificial intelligence was actually coined, they set about creating a number of computer programs that could compose music. They fashioned the output into four musical movements for string quartet and they gave the resulting work the title Iliac Suite, named after the computer on which the programs were run. Now I think this gives us our first and simplest AI composition product. For Hiller and Isaacson, the product was the music. There was no intermediate user experience, no software for someone to use. It was just musical output designed to listen to. So what's the user story here? Why do people want to use it? As a musicophile, I want to hear AI composed music so that I'm entertained. This is a simple question of entertaining people like much of music. Now in the same year, there was another use of AI composition you may have come across. The computer company Burroughs ran an ad in 1956 that featured an AI piece of generated music called Push Button Bertha. The lyrics were written by a person, but the music was written by an AI system. This ran in their ads for their computers. Now, like with Hiller and Isaacson, the product here is still the music. This is the music in question. That's ultimately what the end user is consuming, and they're doing so actively, not passively. They're listening to the music, but the music, you know, while it's the focus of the ad, 
the use case is slightly different from the Hiller and Isaacson example. In the case of the Iliac suite, the musical end product was created for aesthetic reasons. In the case of Pushbuck and Bertha, this ad was created for functional reasons. Now this is similar, but I think it's an important distinction. So we have the same user stories, a music file, I want to hear AI composed music so that I'm entertained, but actually this is now being done for commercial purposes. Now in the same vein of products designed for listening to music, we can fast forward to 2008 when Brian Eno and Peter Chilvers released an app called Bloom that I'm sure you'll have all come across. Its creators describe it as part instrument, part composition, part artwork. It's an, art, it's an iPhone app that allows iPhone users to play ambient music by touching the screen, accompanying the notes you play with calming visuals. And if you stop playing, a music generator takes over. So, you know, this is a generative music app. What's the user story here? As an iPhone user, I want to play with a generative music app so that I'm entertained. Again, this is about entertainment, right? But this introduces a new distinction between types of AI composition product. The music of the Iliac Suite and Push Button Bertha was static. That is, they were composed once and that was the end of it. But Bloom is generative, using the meaning of the term coined by Eno, system composed music that is ever different and changing. There are advantages to both, there are use cases for both, and we'll see examples of both. We can start to build up this kind of categorization of AI music composition products. The next thing I want to talk about um, in this same vein, again, of listening products is Endel, which will come across much more recently, one of the new startups in the space. And what Endel do is they do personalized sounds to help you focus, relax, and sleep. Um, they have, you know, I mean, they use stems, um, they, they also use generative music. Um, there, there's, a, there's something on their site that shows how they use the pentatonic scale in a generative way. Now, what's interesting about Endel, I think, there are many interesting things about them, but they have, they have lots of partnerships in place. These are some of their partnerships you can see on their site. Um, you know, this is really helpful as it shows us loads of potential use cases of AI music. You know, you can see that they're using it for stress reduction with the Apple Watch. You can, you can see they're using it on Twitch uh, with a Twitch channel that puts you to sleep. Um, you can see that they have a high-tech aid for stress-free stress -free flights. There are lots of use cases here. And I would say in general, one of the things we learned at Duke Deck is that often lots of use, use, you need to be careful of having too many use cases. I don't think Endel are going down this route yet. I think partnerships are great, but as Steve Jobs said, don't try to do everything, do one thing well. You know, um, that doing one thing well, having one particular use case is a, is a much safer way of, re of kind of having a surefire method of building a, a, a product that is incredibly useful for people. If you try to do too much, you can confuse people. Um, but you know, I think what Endel are doing really well is their design. You can see this design is fantastic. This is something we have to think about when building AI composition products. We can't just put out code and hope that that will do. We have to think about how to make beautiful products because that's what consumers are used to. Um, so there are lots of user stories here with Endel uh, for these different partnerships, but the core apps user story is I think this. Now ignore that as a 20 something, that one of the problems with apps that are meant to be used by everyone is it's very hard to, divine, to find who the user is. But I'm just gonna say as a 20 something, I want personalized music so that I can focus, relax or sleep. This is basically about relaxation, this new use case. Moving on in the same vein, I wanna talk about another startup you may have heard of called Boomi. Now, the idea with Boomi is that you create AI music, then you release this on streaming services and you make money from it. So you can literally release your AI composed music as a non-musician on Spotify and start making money from that. Um, and I think the user flow is quite interesting to look at. They make it very simple, right? So you select a style. This is, this is kind of similar to what we did at Duke Deck with the simplicity. You select a style, um, you select a specific beat, you then create a song. Um, it's got some nice a, a nice kind of interface showing you what's happening, showing you that composing is going on. It then has really, really simple controls. You can add a vocal firstly. So, you know, not even over the backing, you just record a vocal um, and then it will kind of, it will integrate that into the song for you, which I think is a really nice feature. And again, making it very simple for a, you know, for a non-expert to, to, to kind of create music here. And then they also have really simple editing uh, features for composition and production. Um, so this is what you can do on the composition and production side. You don't have a lot of control. You know, it's, it's, it's really high level. Um, but I think the lesson here from Boomi is a lesson of simplicity. Um, you know, it's really important that we build simplicity into our AI composition products because, you know, if, if we expose everything in our, in our systems, it's going to be way too complex for the average user and we're not going to hit a big enough market. So what's the user story with Boomi? 
as a young professional, again, hard to define who the user is because they're really going for kind of a mass market approach. I want to release music on streaming services with minimal effort so that I can make money. You know, interesting. It's, it, it's really about making money here. Um, the question I think I, I would have, and we'll see in the next couple of years is, is there enough demand for this? Can you really make enough money from releasing music on streaming services or, you know, or actually will we find there's a kind of race to the bottom and, you know, as, as generative music becomes more commonplace, people will be less and less willing to actually pay money for it. You know, um, I'll get, I'll get onto how much money musicians actually make in later in the talk. Um, but I think that's something to think about here. I think we should also think here about the potential backlash against AI music products. This is an important thing to bear in mind. You know, people are nervous about AI music, AI composition. Um, and I think when thinking about the way we design products, we have to think, how do we make sure that we frame them in a way that doesn't scare people away? I think there's a slight danger that putting out AI music on Spotify might scare people. And finally, in this category, I want to talk about Weave. Weave, uh, how it defines itself is your favorite songs adapting to your movement in real time, made for active humans, fitness brands, and artists. So this idea that your favorite songs can change in tempo, in energy, in vibe, to match your movements, um, you know, in things like running, in dance classes, in meditation. Um, and this is, a, this is a nice application, I think, a nice use case for listening to music. What's the user story? As a fitness lover, I want the music I listen to to adapt to my exercise regime so that I can be more immersed in the exercise. That's what they're trying to do. here. So we've got a bunch of different products. We can split listening products into two subcategories. I think you've got the aesthetic, those for aesthetic purposes, like the Iliac Suite and Bloom, and then you've got those for functional purposes, like ads in Push Button Bertha and the new startups, Endel, Boomi, and Weave. So what's the second category? I think the second category to talk about, which a lot of you would have thought about a lot, and I know some of you work on, is tools for musicians. Um, the first person I want to talk about here, you'll all know, is David Cope. Uh, you'll all know his work, experience in musical intelligence, in which he used the idea of recombinancy to build an AI composition system that fooled audiences into thinking he'd discovered new pieces by some of history's greatest composers. But his reasons for starting the project, which you might not know, were really interesting. They give us another product use case for AI composition. He's a composer and he started it because he had writer's block. In his words, my initial idea involved creating a computer program which would have a sense of my overall music style and the ability to track the ideas of the current work such that at any given point I could request a next note, a next measure, next 10 measures, so on. My hope was that this new music would not just be interesting, but would be relevant to my style and to my current work. So it was conceived as a tool to help him compose. And that I think is super interesting because it's something people are working on still today. Now, what's the user story here? It's very different. As a composer, so the user here is the composer, I want a computer program that gives me the next note or measure based on my style and the ideas in the current work. So that, I can re so that I can beat writer's block. This is a very different reason for building an AI composition product. And, it's, and this is that second category of products, tools for musicians. The end result is still music, yes, but the product itself that you're building is something that is meant to help people. In this case, just one person, the composer himself with the composition process. It's a product to be used in the composition process. And there are lots of these that we can look at. And I'm gonna go through a few because they have different use cases. One of the older ones, Band in a Box, you will have heard of, founded in 1988. You enter the chords and Band in a Box automatically generates a complete professional quality arrangement of piano, bass, drums, guitar, other instruments. Now, what's the user story here? Well, in order to find the user story, you can look at the reviews online. Uh, there are several user stories. Um, you know, firstly, as an amateur musician, I wanna generate a full arrangement so that I can practice, right? So there's practice. There's a user story around education for music teachers. There's a user story around inspiration. Again, this is more around the writer's block element for musicians. And there's actually also a user story that, so, that someone brings in. They say, as a documentary maker, I want royalty-free music so that I can source back from music for my documentaries. Now that is something we'll talk about later on in the third category of products, but I think it's interesting with all these reviews and that it shows the potential of one product, Band in a Box, to have multiple use cases. Now, Again, though, if it does too many things, it perhaps doesn't do any of them well enough to become a really big product. And it was something we should think about. Uh, Microsoft Songsmith is another one you'll know, taking your voice um, and creating an accompaniment. Um, again, this is another tool for musicians. 
what, what are the user stories here? Um, you know, I think the main user story really is a singer, I want to automatically add a backing track to my vocal line so that I can release my music. But they also mentioned it's free for teachers to use in their classrooms. So again, it's about education, you know? So, so maybe another example of a product that's trying to do a bit too much. Um, lots of small use cases rarely equal one really compelling use case. Uh, in, in this case, actually, they're targeting it at both non-musicians and musicians. Uh, they actually say that on their site. And I think this confuses the user story. These two groups are gonna need very different features from a product. A musician and a non-musician need very different tools. So I, I, would, I would counsel people not to try to do too much with an individual product. Um, and I'll talk about one you'll all know, some of you are involved in Magenta Studio, um, music plugins, uh, standalone plugins and plugins for Ableton Live. Now there are a bunch of user stories for this product. Um, and really the, the, these are broken down into the kind of five sub products that Magenta I think currently offers. Um, and I think the user stories correspond to those. So, but all of them you can, you can take as a, as, a, as a musician, basically as an Ableton Live user. And this I think is key. All these user stories are really for one set of users. Um, I want to extend material I've written. I want to add groove. I want to generate new material. I want to create material that mixes qualities of inputs. And I want to create a drum beat from other inputs. These all have reasons. And I think they're all quite well thought through. They also all overlap with things that have been done previously, like by, by Cope and others. But they're doing them with new technology, and I think in a better way. Um, and I think this, you know, packaging these as different sub products is very good. It's, it's, it's much better, I think, than trying to say one product can be used for multiple things. Each of these products has a very clear use case and a very clear user story. And it's also nice to see that this is factored into musicians' existing workflows in Ableton Live. Because one big thing to think about when making these AI composition products is how it will realistically be adopted. Often people might not want a new standalone product, but an understanding of how they currently work, in this case with plugins, can lead you to shape your product around this and make a plugin where that's how people actually like to work. And the final one I wanna mention, because I think it's interesting, is AWS Deep Composer, their keyboard. They actually built a physical keyboard. And this is super interesting because it's for a different user group. It's for developers. It gives, they say it gives developers a creative way to get started with machine learning and experiment with music generation models. And I think that's interesting because it's another user story more around education. As a developer, I want a musical keyboard and online console for generating music so that I can learn about generate, generative models. Um, and I think this is, this is interesting, an interesting use case. I mean, I would say, you know, I think it's, it's maybe a small use case and there is at least a question here as to whether there's also another use case here which is as Amazon, I want to release a musical keyboard and online console for generating music so that I can gather training data to train generative models. I think that's an open question and something actually that lots of people in these kinds of products think about. Um, so I think there are, there are always questions as to what real user stories are and how they overlap. So I think we can divide these tools for musicians into five categories. Those for inspiration, those for extension or completion of material, those for humanization, those for practice, and those for education. And I want to now talk about the third category. And this is products for media, media products. Products used to create music for other media. Duke Deck was one of these and, and given, yeah, and there are other startups like Duke Deck, like Ampa. Um, since Duke Deck was our startup, I thought I'd do a bit of a deeper dive into some of our product decisions. What was our user story? So this is where I revealed that our product had multiple user stories and, and products do, they generally have different user stories for different features. What's important is understanding who the user is and what the core reasons are for them using your product. So our user story was really as follows. As, again, it was all for video creators. As a video creator, I want unique music so that the music in my video doesn't sound familiar to people. I want royalty free music so I can save money. And I want to control the duration and climax point of a piece of music so it will fit well with my video. We found from doing user testing that these were the compelling use cases. Um, so let's have a bit of a closer look at our product just to give some insights as to how we designed our product. Firstly on the landing page, and this unfortunately isn't still live I'm afraid now that we're in TikTok, um, but in our, on our landing page, we had this big call to action letting people experiment with our technology, making it super simple to dive in and understand how to use it. We then, when they generated a track, encouraged them to sign up and this, this encouraged more signups and got people retaining on the product much more. This is a good point for us to kind of collect information about who that user was. We then imitated products that people know. We tried to build our site to look like an existing production music site, right? With filters for styles and things on the left with tracks in the middle. 
with a, with a, with a big display up top. Again, making, making something that people understand, that people are, are, you know, are used to um, in terms of the way it's designed. We tried to make creation really easy. Again, like Boomi, very simple controls for making a track. We focused on beautiful design, or what we thought was beautiful design. Um, you know, we spent, we spent a lot of time and effort making this a really nice thing to use. And then we thought a lot about monetization, how to monetize. And actually, we ended up realizing there were a lot of people who wanted music, but weren't in a position to pay for it. So what we did was we said, we will give you a piece of music for free if you give us credit, if you say in your YouTube video that you use Duke Deck. Or if you don't want to do that, you can just pay a dollar. This is something we actually took from the Noun Project, which is an icon site, and was a really effective mechanism. We actually found that, you know, you can't, you can't assume everyone who just downloads something for free will give you credit, but we found that 50% of people did, and it was amazing for spreading word of mouth. Um, so a couple more apps uh, in this space, in music for media, uh, Mubit, uh, royalty-free music for apps and content makers. Uh, what they're doing is they're streaming music into apps and into services. So they've got an API uh, that will stream music into these things. Um, and I think the user story, the main user story here is as an app developer, I want copyright free music in my app so that the app gets the benefit of that music affordably. Um, so it's really interesting that they're actually going for the royalty free license angle. You know, this is quite a utilitarian approach, but it's a real USP, uh, unique selling point of AI music you know, royalty free. The fact this is royalty free is very compelling for users. And the final thing I wanted to mention was Mellow Drive. Uh, it's not around anymore, but it, it was a really fascinating idea. Um, adaptive music for augmented reality and video games. Uh, the user story here, as a game developer, I want music that responds to my gameplay so that the game is more compelling for users. I mention this because I do think it's a compelling use case. It's one where feasibility is important. Um, but I think the use case is, very is, is, is a very compelling one. And so I'm quickly going to go on to feasibility and, and a tiny bit on viability as well, just to finish off. Um, most of this is about desirability. It's about building products that people want to use. So feasibility. As I said, I'll leave this mostly to you, to the researchers, but there are three things I want to mention. The first is thinking hard about what I call the quality ladder. Something we thought about a lot at Duke Tech. You need to be honest with yourselves about where you currently sit on the, on the ladder of musical quality and you need to target the right users accordingly. You know, UGC, user-generated content video creators, you know, need a certain type of music. Documentary makers need music that is better than that. Filmmakers need music that's better than that. And if you want to get your music in the charts, it needs to be better than that still. There is this ladder and it's very important not to kind of go too high on this ladder too fast because people will not want the, the music that you deliver. Um, the second is thinking hard about what I call the quality variation spectrum. So, you know, you can often have very high quality music produced by these systems, but you will find the music is always very similar. Or you can have, you know, much more varied music where actually a lot of the time it's doing stuff that really isn't really acceptable for most listeners. Finding the right point in the spectrum given what your product is, is absolutely key. Uh, and finally, latency. Uh, it's just important to think about whether you're building something for real time uh, or whether you're not. We chose not to build something for real time usage at Duke Deck, partly because we used virtual instruments uh, and these made it very hard to, to deliver something in real time. And we didn't actually need to for video creation. But there can be a trade off as well between the quality of a piece of music generated by these systems and the speed with which you can create that music. So you need to consider this when, when thinking about your product. Um, and finally, I'll just a quick word about viability. Um, this is an important one because I, 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 th I think it's really worth thinking about. The, the main message here is that the markets we are talking about are not that big. Um, the global recorded music market in 2018 was $19 billion, but most of that was at the top end. Most of that is going to big artists. You know, a recent survey found that you know, really the, the average musician isn't making that much money. The average musician in 2017 uh, was making around $35,000 a year. Um, and so we need to think carefully about how we build products for this market without taking jobs away from these people and but products that are big enough to make a decent chunk of money because without, without making those products, we're not, you know, we're not gonna get the investment into the space that really actually lets us continue to research this, continue to build products in the space. Um, so we need to think hard about where the money is in these markets. Similarly, we find the same in um, music production tools for musicians. I remember speaking to one of the big uh, music production software companies a couple of years ago, and they said the thing about AI composition products in this space is they're a niche product in an already niche market. 
Um, you know, th these might sound like big figures, but, you know, compare this kind of thing to, you know, to the kind of $60 billion video game market in the US. And you realize that actually these figures aren't the kinds of figures that attract the biggest investors in the world of venture capital. Um, and similarly, in, in, in music production, the music production market, you've got a 1.5 billion projected market by 2024. Um, so I think, you know, I will, you know, I will, I will just leave you with, sorry, I've slightly run out of time, but I'll just leave you with, you know, this summary of, I think the problems we face in the space. Um, first, there is a very high quality, high bar for the musical quality people need in these products. We have to, we have to build systems that write really good music or they won't work. Secondly, we have to create really simple interfaces for people to use. We can't be too focused on the research. Thirdly, we have to make sure we address the problem of perception and any potential backlash against AI music. There are ethical ways of using this that we have to, we have to really focus on. Fourthly, we have to bear in mind that some of these markets are not the biggest markets in the world and some of them have cheap alternatives and we need to really think about that when designing these products. And fifthly, related to that, we have to bear in mind that if we want to continue research in this space, one of the only reasons that we get grant money and that kind of thing is because there are interesting products being built. Um, there is a triangle here of research leading to monetizable products, leading to more funding coming into the space. And we need to keep building. And that, I think, is why this is so important that we think about how to build compelling products in the space. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation of this, uh, like app music AI apps ecosystem and AI music uh, app design. And so we have some like, questions from the chat. So first, like from Bob, uh, what would be the user stories at TikTok now? Will you change your user story now that you have been integrated within uh, TikTok, or is it the same? Uh, can you do like more things that, that you couldn't do before, for instance? Yeah, I, I would. So I've actually. Yeah, I, I would, so I've actually. I've, oh, sorry, I couldn't hear myself. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Roll, yeah. actually, roll. So I think there's a bit of a lag. Uh, I think there's a bit of a lag. Uh, can you turn your audio off? Thanks, sorry. Um, yeah, so I've actually moved role to um, out of. I was running the, the lab, which was Duke Deck, for uh, one and a half years. I've actually moved role now to the core product team. So that's not really my domain anymore. Um, but I think that at any of these companies, you know, be that, be that TikTok, be that Magenta, you know, there are things going on at Sony, there are things going on at other companies as well. Um, I think ultimately there is a wide range of research. And I think that one of the things, one of the things these big tech companies do is they, 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 they give people the time to explore different user stories. That's why I think it's so exciting that there are labs like Magenta, that there are labs like the, like the lab at ByteDance um, and other companies too. Because like, you know, I mean, you know, I would, we probably tried like 50 user stories in the last one and a half years and probably two of them will stick and you never know what they are. And actually in, in, to an extent in this field, you need, you don't just need research. You don't just need lots of people writing papers, which you do absolutely need, but you also need labs like, like these experimenting with these user stories, trying like throwing lots of pain at the wall and seeing what sticks. Because at the moment, you know, we don't yet have the killer use a story, I think, for AI composition. I don't think it's out there yet. I don't think it's been done, but I think it's going to be done. I think this is going to be a hugely important part of, you know, the future of music and of technology. Um, so I think that's really what you get at these labs. You get the, these opportunities to throw paint at the wall and see what sticks. I probably can't comment on what will stick at TikTok, unfortunately, um, but, uh, but hopefully something will stick. And so another question from Rebecca Ledger. Uh, which is exactly about this is like how do you evaluate the exchange between research and industry in this uh, ai and music field yeah that's a very good question I, I i mean in terms of how how one actually goes about evaluating it um i think really the question has to be how much of the research being done is being successfully productized i think you know ultimately there there are other, there are other ways we can we can judge this i mean what is the flow of people between acad academia and industry we've hired a bunch of people from academia we've had people who then left our team and gone back to academia so i think this flow is good but i think ultimately the core way of measuring this is is the research actually being used and i think at the moment we're at a difficult and interesting stage of ai composition technology development in that some of the biggest things that some of the biggest innovations that are coming out you know you look at 
you look at jukebox from OpenAI earlier this year, are simply not productizable. They're not monetizable, at least in their current form um, at all. I mean, you look at that and that's largely because of copyright issues. Um, you know, there's no way you can build a product out of that. Um, now that doesn't make it, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's not useful research, it is, but we need to get to the stage, I think, where the biggest developments in research are actually able to be used in products. Um, because as I say, if we don't get to that stage, we're at, this, we're at this great point right now where we've got companies like Google and ByteDance and other companies willing to kind of chuck money at this and like basically, you know, have labs in this space. But if we don't kind of really monetize these things, we don't turn them into successful products, I, I think it won't last. Um, so I do think there has to be more conversation between academia and industry to get this stuff productized. And another, uh, like the usual question, but uh, what is your ideas about the fear of AI music? And do you think this fear has evolved within the time or? I think, um, I think the fear is entirely justified. Um, and I think we need to work very hard as a community to ensure that the, that the direction we go is away from that fear, is away from what causes that fear. I think if we use, if we use AI music to replace musicians, which, you know, which we can't, we couldn't do totally, but, you know, I, I do think people could do on the production music side. Like, you know, I, I do think there's a real danger to production music composers from AI music. If, we, if I think we go down that route, I think we get to a difficult place. And, and as, a, as a musician personally, and I know lots of other researchers in the space of musicians, I think it's one we should avoid morally. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to focus on the use cases that are impossible without AI, right? So if you look at music that is responsive and adaptive in real time, if you look at music that is unique to the individual way where actually you have different people getting different music, I think what I try to do these days with AI music products is think, is this product impossible without AI? If you're just using AI to cut costs and to get a composer out of the loop, I personally think that's probably like, my personal ethics say that's not acceptable. But if you are doing something that's otherwise impossible, I think that's where it's a really exciting thing. And that's the direction we should go. And that's how we should, that's I think how we can also reframe the conversation and, and, and move people away from where, they, where they're scared about AI music. And a question from uh, Lydia Jovanovska. And it's about like how uh, you are monetizing your product. And so she's asking uh, if the creators of the musical pieces produced from Jump Deck own their music, if they choose to pay for it, and uh, how they are able to license this. Yeah, absolutely. So at Duke Deck, what we did um, was we had three different tiers. Um, as a standard, you didn't, the, the, the owner transferred any rights they had over to Duke Deck. So Duke Deck retained the rights in the compositions. And, but we would grant, one of the nice things you can do with this stuff is you can grant a perpetual worldwide royalty-free license to use that music to the user. And that's what we did. Um, we actually thought quite hard about how to monetize them. And as I said, we had that lowest tier of either it being free or or, or just a dollar. And that actually was really successful because a bunch of people paid a dollar, which does start, start, to, start to stack up. And a bunch of people couldn't pay, but instead advertised for us, right? And that was great. We then had a, a, a tier for businesses um, where they would pay a bit more money. They'd pay, I think, about $20, $21 for a track. Again, much cheaper than the alternatives, but this, this kind of worked well. This was something that businesses who wanted this music could use. Um, and we did actually also allow people to buy the copyright to their track if they wanted to. Um, so I do think that's another thing you can do. Um, I think you need to be a little bit careful um, with this because I think there are, I mean, when we get into copyright questions around AI music, there are just a load of unanswered questions, I think. And any business that kind of does this these days is kind of not throwing caution to the wind, but it's kind of saying, look, we're going to take a position on this until it's actually tested. We just got to do something. Um, so I think like, but, but I mean, it worked for us. I mean, I think one of the nice things about that is it can show people that actually the other alternatives are cheaper and really good value, you know? And I think that, um, so what we found was that the fact that we let people buy the copyright, not many people bought the copyright because most people don't need to. But what that did was it showed, it, it, it acted as a comparison and showed people actually paying $20 for a worldwide it, perpetual license for a track was not bad at all. Um, and so it kind, of, it kind of shepherded people towards that option. All right. Thanks a lot, Ed, again, for your talk and the questions. And I think we will be closing the stream.
And for like further questions, I think we will should move on to the Slack channels. Thanks. Right. I'll jump on the 